start with a little introduction, right? So, hi, yes. my name is Marcia Rummel. I am running for the 76th Assembly District seat. I have been um, on the City Council now for seven terms, representing District 6 on Madison's Near East Side. Um, I've also served as the Council President and have authored and sponsored over 1,500 ordinances during my tenure. I've worked with um, the mayor and my fellow colleagues to push uh, to do budgeting and, and I'm proud of my role working with residents to facilitate their in engagement in our local democracy. And so um, I've spent um, last five years working for the Wisconsin Department of Revenue. I have a lot of experience about tax law. And before that, I spent over 20 years working at um, a variety of cooperatives, the last one being the Rainbow Bookstore Co-op. And I think that helps inform my, um, my judgment about the role of workers in our democracy. And, um, and I also am a member now of Ask Me Local One. And um, I think since we're in a global pandemic, there's a lot of things we need to do. And I think my skills help prepare me for that. So thank you. Um, support publicly funded elections. I do support publicly funded elections. Just, 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 for, just for a thing, we we, um, we will, each of us will, will, will actually read them just so our, our this oh. will be recorded so our viewers can okay. see it. And we'll, we'll um, alternate asking the questions. So um, maybe I'll do the first one, Peter. Sounds good. Um, uh, uh, oh, we should introduce ourselves too. I'm, uh, I'm Greg Jaboski. I'm the uh, uh, secretary of the Dane County chapter of, uh, of OWR, of our Wisconsin Revolution. Um, and Peter. Yep, uh, my name is Peter German, he, him, his. Uh, I'm the uh, interim co-chair of the uh, Dane County chapter of the uh, our, our Wisconsin Revolution. Awesome. Okay, and the first question we have is, do you support publicly funded elections and why or why not? I do, I've spent the last many, many days making phone calls to raise money so that I can um, do mailings and do outreach to voters. You know, with COVID, we're, it's harder to go do the traditional kinds of outreach, which is knocking on doors and that kind of thing. So, um, you know, in order to get, I mean, I believe I have some name recognition based on my city experience, but, you know, not everyone knows me and some people are new to the city and, and I need to do at least four mailings before the end of, uh, before the primary. So, yeah, that costs a lot of money and, and, you know, I feel like I spend a lot of time like cherry picking friends who have more money and understanding friends who have less money and trying to like manage the time to like prepare for interviews like yours and all the other work. Plus I have a day job and I'm city council. So, you know, trying to balance all that is a lot of work. So I think publicly funded elections would help not just candidates, but anyone who wanted to participate in or non-traditional people who want to participate feel like they have a chance and they wouldn't just be outspent automatically if they didn't have all the infrastructure ready to go or know all the kind of insider types who know about all the various technologies that are out there to help candidates. So I think it would level the playing field. Awesome. Oh yeah. Um, and so then the uh, second question is, um, uh, would you favor extending the uh, time frame to vote at polls during the elections to like a minimum of uh, two weeks ahead of the election date? I believe the city already has that in place where we allow um, early voting and I definitely support that. I also support making sure that people know they can get ballots mailed to them. Um, and, and that involves some kind of technical work as far as you know, people uploading their IDs and all that kind of stuff, as well as relying on the post office to help us. And so we really need to also like say how important the post office is if we wanna protect our voting rights. Uh, what model or plan do you prefer for redistricting? Well, clearly we have an undemocratic model where the people in power pick their voters. Uh, I think we need to push for an independent um, process where um, either through the judiciary or some kind of independent civilian citizen kind of um, body that could make fair judgments about redistricting based on population and, you know, some sort of topography and other kind of issues that 
but not about like cherry picking voters. Awesome. Um, and then uh, what would you describe um, as your uh, top three legislative priorities? Um, and then what would you do to uh, move them through the legislature? Obviously, it's very um, heavily gerrymandered towards Republicans at the moment, but yeah. Well, obviously, as you all are very uh, aware of, fair maps are a key issue. I mean, at some point, as a person running as a Democrat um, for assembly in a safe seat, um, it's unless something really changes, I don't see how the, the balance of power becomes fairer or more uh, accountable to the public unless we have fair maps. And so I don't know that I'm not guaranteeing that I, you know, it might be a, a legal battle and we'll see how that goes, but that would be one I would be definitely willing to work on, you know, to have a nonpartisan uh, process. Um, and then in the meantime, I would fight um, to against um, kind of the purges of voters and all the other undemocratic processes that the Republicans are engaged in. Um, the, another um, really key issue for me is that I've been working on for a number of years is safe drinking water. I uh, represent a district that, you know, to the extent that Madison has any industrial legacy, it exists on the near east side of Madison. So I have dealt with the Madison Kip Corporation. We've closed various wells due to um, contamination of water and, and, and we continue. Now we've learned about PFAS at Truax Field as a contaminant that's um, going into our groundwater system and we closed well 15 near um, East Town because of contamination from that. So I, and I know statewide is an issue as far as farming of K, from CAFOs and um, manure and nitrate. So it's a, it's a fundamental right we have to save drinking water. And I think it is a kind, it's an issue that will cross whatever lines there are, you know, between partisan parties because everyone needs it. Um, and, and I would work with, you know, others around the state on that topic because it, it plays out differently depending on where you are. Um, and so, you know, one of the things that's really important to me with Governor Evers getting reelected is having the DNR be back to more of its old self and having scientists and science-based decision-making as part of our um, culture. You know, he created that, that PFAS team that's doing a lot of good work and, you know, other states like Michigan and around the country have done a lot of good work on, on PFAS as far as making sure we have standards. And, and the Wisconsin Health, um, whatever, is, w, is working on new groundwater standards. So I've been following that and I currently serve on the Madison Water Utility. And so I've been keenly following all that. Um, the other thing I've worked on and is now of course, just in, on everyone's mind is um, police accountability. Um, my district is one where it had more than its fair share of officer involved shootings over the, since I, in my seven terms of being elected, there's been at least three in the last seven years of people that ran into police officers and ended up dead. Um, the first one was from my, you know, direct experience with Paul Heenan, who was um, someone intoxicated, tried to go home to the wrong house, neighbors called the police, but then realized they knew he lived down the street. He was kind of a new housemaid of neighbors and tried to undo the call, but a, a rogue cop showed up, didn't wait for backup and, and killed him because he didn't respond to orders. And so that started me on this path towards um, police accountability and how we use force. At that point, the, those neighbors started the community response team, Amelia and Nathan Royko Mauer have been leaders that I've been working with for se seven years now. And they worked with Representative Taylor and other assembly members to change state law so that a police department would not be the ones that investigate themselves and that it should go to the uh, state level at the, the Department of Justice. So that is the new law. So when Tony Robinson got um, shot in 2015, it was a different world after, um, you know, Ferguson and, and, and he was a young African-American man and it, you know, some things around um, Polly were just like, you know, it didn't, nothing really, it wasn't quite the same, but once 
with Tony, it became a real, a real, an uprising of, of concern. And the Common Council initiated a process that's just still in, in the works to create an ad hoc committee that has working to um, hired a, a consultant, came up with a lot of recommendations to improve our police department. And meanwhile, during that period, I was the council president and I chaired an, an alder work group um, that came up with 13 recommendations about use of force, it, adopting a root cause analysis. And so when the, you know, when the, the murder of um, George Floyd happened, in some ways the council and the city was well prepared to talk about community control of the police because one of the major decisions of this um, ad hoc committee was to um, have an independent monitor and a civilian oversight board. So it's going to the state level with all that experience. I think one of the issues is the state um, statute requires a police and fire commission model. And, and that is, can be, it's a pretty weak model, but it could be strengthened by this independent monitor and, and a civilian oversight board that could be more proactive than what the PFC has been historically. Historically, they rarely find against any police officer in a complaint. I mean, rarely if ever. And so the, the chances of that are just really stunningly low. So we know there's a problem. And, and so that is something I would continue working on. The thing that has struck me lately is the role of the district attorney, that um, they're the ones that now on the local level investigate the criminal wrongdoing of a police officer, but they're embedded together with police and law enforcement. Their job relies on enforced law enforcement to do, to take cases to court. And so it's, it's, a, an, it's a, a tricky relationship that I think we should take away and, and remove the district attorney and have maybe a more independent judicial review of officer involved shootings. And then there are some of the issues that the, the previous, um, like Chris worked on previously that to continue uh, on those paths of, um, you know, having stronger policies about the duty to preserve lives. And then also just in general, um, adopting more, having a more uh, awareness about criminal justice reform and all the ways that we need to, as some people call it, defund the police, but reallocate resources to mental health professionals and um, or mental health ambulances even to deal with people. Like one of the persons that got killed was a, a person with a, a men, suffering from a mental health disorder and needed maybe somebody not with a gun to help. <laughs> so that's a, a, a one thing. And then I think, I mean, there's other things of course that um, are important, but um, I think I can stop there. It's a multi-part question. Um, I'll just read it all um, it's in chat as well. Uh, in the emergence from the pandemic, would you support a state level economic hardship payment? Do you support direct payments to residents? Describe the top five components that you think should be in such a bill. I think the thing we've learned from the pandemic is how we um, wrapped up people's health care with their jobs. So if suddenly you're upside down and your job goes away, either as a worker or as a person who owns a business, um, you're just really, it's really uh, like you're going to go down the economic drain if, if you don't have supports like state assistance. So I, I support um, the hardship payments. I think, you know, the feds doing, you know, it was, they should do that every month. I think it should be a federal uh, initiative to, to fund during this pandemic, you know, $2,000 a month, like, like um, some state federal level representatives are requesting because I think that will help people get through the period of time and or they could use those CARES funds to um, send money to the, the state level who then could, you know, create programs, say for renters, you know, some renters don't, you know, like can't pay the rent and, you know, landlords don't necessarily want to get rid of tenants, but on the other hand, they got to pay their mortgage. And so it's just a trickle down thing where so people who have all these bills to pay need help so that they can at least maintain um, the status quo for people until we can start to uh, recover. So, you know, I think there's different ways that we can um, craft payments. So another thing is, you know, on this federal level, they did um, the 
unemployment for um, gig workers. So we definitely need that kind of thing. So even unemployment's related to a traditional W-2 kind of job versus you know, a 1099 non-employee compensation kind of job. So we need to make sure that people in all the different varieties of work have a way to um, secure themselves. And then at some point we need to have the staff to be able to um, process all these requests. I mean, I heard more than one story of horror really of people trying to get unemployment and not getting through to the phone lines and, and you know, that this, the, the, the computer systems at that agency are, are so antiquated that the, they were overpowered and they don't have enough staffing and plus COVID are working from home. It just, it was just like, um, you know, it's just a huge, crazy thing. So um, the, the top five components, I think it should be, it's based on need. I mean, at some point, some people with a lot of money don't really need help. I, personally, I, as my job at the Department of Revenue, I can work from home. I don't need $2,000 a month, assuming that my job continues. So I think at some point, if, it's, if you're, that should be a consideration that you know, maybe everyone gets the twelve hundred dollars as some kind of nominal thing, but I, you know, I don't really personally need the help. Assuming again that my job continues, so that would be one component, and I think it would has to also reach to tenants, business owners, and different categories of people who work in our economy, so that we don't miss anybody. Like artists, you know, artists, for example, I spent a lot of time thinking about artists, and you know, they need help too. And you, if you're not doing public or private art, you're just not getting income. So, um, and I think pretty much it should be federal, you know, and then the state can help in various program, programmatic ways with, you know, housing or loans to businesses or other kinds of things. Awesome, and then sort of lecture, we're on the uh, um, uh, topic of housing. Um, uh, how can you guarantee uh, housing uh, to citizens and uh, specifically like how would you deal uh, with the financial situation of uh, everybody who's facing uh, eviction uh, because of the pandemic and uh, what specific solutions would you propose in regards? Um, you all probably know under state law we can't guarantee anybody a right to housing but we all should have a right housing should be considered a right and you know I the city and has sponsored resolutions like that, as has the county, and I su support the city one, and have worked on a lot of ways to create more different types of housing for people so that they have opportunities. Like, you know, one of the things um, about housing is that what's affordable is what's considered to be 30% of your income. What, no matter what your income is, if you spend no more than 30% of your income, that's considered affordable housing. But there's no housing, new housing being built now, at least in Madison, that um, people who, who make less than $15 an hour can afford based on that model of what's affordable. So I think we really need to, in order to provide more housing, the state needs to step up uh, funding for um, affordable housing programs. Um, at least under capitalism, the current way that developers build market rate housing is not going to ever um, address the needs of lower income or uh, and working people. So it's the model just, you know, there, it doesn't pay for it. It doesn't provide that. And I've done a lot of, I've worked a lot on developments in my district and there are some developers who don't even want to find out about how to do affordable housing, but you know, if they just tell you what it costs them, the land and all these other things, what it costs to build, you can see from their point of view why they can't provide um, lower cost housing. Plus there is a market in our area for really expensive housing. Some people call it the epic worker phenomenon. You know, people making 80,000 plus a year who are young and really, you know, they can live anywhere they want and often do driving up rent. So we're faced with gentrification and displacement in our community. And so some of the ways that we can work on that, we would require changes to state law because right now we don't allow for rent control. We don't, we had an inclusionary zoning law, but rent, uh, rental was excluded. Um, and so we need to, to revisit and review all those 
um, limits in the state to how we can provide more um, assistance. And so, um, you know, one way is, there's different ways that, um, that we can help pay for that too. One, of course, is to change our tax law to make it um, more progressive so that we have more money to share with our community. Um, the second one that I've looked at a little bit is how they changed, recently changed the tax incremental financing law and now you can keep a, 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 a TIF district open for an extra year after you've paid your basic costs and use that money for affordable housing. So that helps a city like Madison, but it doesn't really help smaller communities where the projects that they may use for TIF don't create a lot of increment. So, but if you extended that one year to three years, you would have more increment that could be used, you know, all across the state for communities because this isn't just a problem for Madison, this is a statewide problem. And a lot of times the surrounding communities in Madison just say, oh, let them go to Madison and don't do anything to help to create more housing. So I think that would sort of level the playing field. Um, and also, oh, we're getting to the next question. Um, no, you, no, keep going. I just... You know, that's another thing, you know, there's been, there was this emergency orders prohibiting eviction but we need to have more tenant protections so that there's just cause and there are other things. And that's another thing that we need to undo from Act 10, those, those deplorable landlord-based laws that took away people's rights to uh, safe and fair housing. So a lot of changes need to happen at the state level to, to make sure people have access to safe and affordable housing. I'll go to the next question. Um, Will you fight for a single payer healthcare system at the state level? And do you support a federal single payer healthcare system? I definitely do. And again, as I said before, the, the COVID pandemic makes it so clear why we need, like how our system is an utter fail, capital F failure. So um, we, need, we need single payer. We need um, whatever you call it, Medi Medicaid for all or Medicare for all. And we need to do that as soon as possible. It, and I, you know, I, I think Senator Sanders and others have made the case why it's, it can work and it might be cheaper. And we just have to keep fighting for that. On the state level, we need to, you know, they didn't expand under Walker, they didn't expand Medicaid. And so they gave up uh, uh, millions and millions of dollars in federal money and cost the state more money to provide um, a, a, um, healthcare to people just above the federal poverty level. And that just seemed really backwards, for, especially for you know, people who claim to care about like financial fiduciary responsibility. They, they cost us more money to, to, um, to provide healthcare for people who need it. Um, so I think you know, we, we definitely need some fundamental changes. Uh, it's just not a workable system the way we have it now. And we can see just with the pandemic, how clear that is. So I definitely would fight for single payer at the state and federal level. Awesome. Um, and then sort of in uh, a similar vein, um, you know, a lot of people right now, essential workers are forced to go back uh, to work and, um, you know, uh, in a very unprotected way. Uh, would you support, um, uh, you know, workers' rights laws, helping those who are forced to return to work, um, but are currently risking um, their health. And of course, um, you know, absent uh, a current uh, single payer system in Wisconsin, um, would you be willing to uh, push uh, the state to guarantee medical coverage through uh, badger care uh, for those who are uh, affected in this uh, unique way? I definitely would support um, expanding rights of people who are forced back to work. I mean, that just is another kind of crazy thing with the care payments that encourage businesses to get people back working when it might not be safe. So it's just like, you know, we don't want to put people in that position of deciding whether they can, you know, if they want to work or have to and suffer with the chance of catching COVID and risking infection. So um, definitely I would support rights like that. And yeah, definitely medical coverage through Badger Care. And even on the local level, we're struggling to, you know, 
people, I get, Kenny, is starting to get a lot of emails from residents who say, how come we haven't made masks mandatory? Uh, you know, Milwaukee might, other cities have like Los Angeles. And, and, and then this, the, the public health pushback is through the equity lens. Like, you know, we don't want to make it so that workers have to, their jobs would be at jeopardy if they insisted on it, or if people of color feel like they are being targeted unfairly if they wear masks, you know, for assuming they're going to be, you know, doing things wrong or whatever. And so I, I know that those are legitimate concerns, but I think somehow if people don't, if we don't really take this seriously, we're just going to infect more people and prolong the, the economic misery for everyone. Um, next one, we're going to have a couple questions in a row on, uh, uh, on policing. And the first one's just kind of a quick uh, uh, checklist thing. You can answer yes or no to, uh, to either of them. Um, do you support the propositions outlined in uh, Campaign Zero? We took it right from them. This, this goes back before the current protest, uh, which includes, um, do you, would you favor ending broken windows policing? Yes. Uh, community oversight of police? Yes. Uh, laws limiting the use of force? Yes. Um, do you support independently investigating and prosecuting uh, police? Yes. You got, get, are you thinking on that or? I didn't hear you, I'm sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. Do, do you support, uh, and, and you may have answered this in the previous question, but we'll do it anyway. Do you support independently investigating and prosecuting police? Yes. Uh, do, do you support community representation for police oversight? Yes. Um, do, do you support uh, mandatory body cams and filming of the police? Yes, and that's been a long time coming because at first I started out thinking, well, of course I did, and then I, realized how th there's a lot of nuances to body cameras that I think the city now is sort of going to start to reinvestigate. But I think overall it provides um, some accountability that it may not be a thing that stops things from happening, but at least there's more accountability with them. So yes. Uh, do, do you support training that, um, that, that can minimize uh, negative interactions with police? They definitely need more training to de to learn how to de-escalate. They don't have enough. Okay. Um, do, do you want to put in, uh, an end on the state level for any kind of for-profit policing? An end, yes. And uh, do you support the demilitarization of the police? Definitely. That's part of the problem. It's been a 20 plus year evolution where they just go get toys from the feds and use them on communities. It's really ridiculous. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, so the next part is uh, sort of like a, a three-parter, um, but starting off, um, as far as uh, funding for the police, uh, would you support increasing, uh, decreasing, leveling, or eliminating uh, funding for the police? I think there's short-term and long-term answers. Like right now, I you know, we're in the middle of a budget year, and it's hard to say I would could eliminate things, but there's things in place for that. But going forward in the next budget cycle, I definitely, you know, I, I think I know more than your average person about this, but there's the way Madison does its policing, they have act proactive and reactive categories. So proactive is doing cool stuff like, you know, working with kids and, you know, getting involved with community and reactive is just calls. But then they understaff the, the basic patrol. And then they say, well, we don't have enough police. Well, we need to better balance the type of work that you're assigning to officers because you have plenty of people working for you. They're just not all out on patrol. And honestly, patrol is definitely stressful. So that's a long way to say that I would um, support decreasing funding with the caveat that they also need to rearrange how they're staffing the police so that we are providing, because people do want to feel safe in their homes and on the street. I think that's legitimate. And I mean, to the extent that police respond, they're not necessarily there when anything happens, but they could respond 
and hopefully they're doing it professionally and with care. And so, but we also need to make sure not, not everyone needs a person with a gun to come to respond to them. So I think that part of it is reallocating the money that's from policing to other types of services, whether it's that um, mental health ambulance or just more social workers and others who um, provide services to the community. Um, and then for the next one, it sounds like you actually have a little bit of uh, experience with this already, but um, um, so let's say uh, in a hypothetical, uh, a police officer in your jurisdiction has been, um, has been filmed killing someone that they have uh, stopped or arrested. Uh, how would be your uh, immediate response? Well, you're right. I have told this at least three times in the last seven years. So before the state law changed, it was really frustrating. I went to then Chief Noble Ray and I was like, I want to have a neighborhood meeting. I want to know what happened. I want you to hear what people's concerns are. Oh, no, Alder, we have to wait. We have to wait till the investigation's done. And, you know, that took a long time because, you know, I mean, it does take time, I guess, to somewhat. And this person wasn't really filmed. So, um, and so that was really frustrating. But now that it's at the Department of Justice level, there's the criminal and the, and the civil components. And the, the, so the criminal component is investigated by the Department of Justice and then whether the DA decides whether to prosecute. That does take a little while and they won't do anything until that process goes through. But then the question of like, okay, what if they say that person has um, met all the standards of you know, Graham versus Connor, then they won't do it. And then when it goes to the civil thing, then that sort of influences what they do there. So um, the response is like, you know, in other states, they just fire people. We, under our police and fire commission, we can't just fire people. There's a more of a legalistic process that you have to undergo. So even though like I could say, Steve Himesness was this rogue officer who was kind of gross, um, bullied his fellow officers and was a racist, but they, they had to, it took them almost a year to get rid of that guy. And so at some point we need to relook at um, the, pro the complaint process. Like, you know, as I mentioned earlier, would a, a civilian oversight body be a more effective way than if like you didn't get the right answers as a community? So I, I, I would support that. Um, I also support taking, as I said earlier, taking the district attorney out of the mix. I don't know about you all, but um, when I watched um, District Attorney, it was in when he was announcing for Tony Robinson, I, I almost felt sorry for him. The guy was sweating bricks. Like it must have been such a trust, stressful thing where he's saying it was okay that this kid got killed, which even by the film is not so clear. You know, even the film from the car wasn't that clear that this was okay to just, you know, clear this officer, but um, the, I think we really re we need to do is change the standards because if, if it's so easy to, if just saying I was afraid for my life is the only standard, they're always going to be um, gotten off. So I think we need to st change those standards. I mean, and part of it is a con constitutional standard, but also just how we um, create local standards for and training standards. So we need better training. We need local um, police departments to have standard operating procedures that have higher level of standards about you have a right to protect life. Um, you know, taking away life is the last resort and, and those kind of things. Um, so I think the response is, is multifaceted because the community, you know, especially if it's a young person of color is going to show up and protest and, and be militant, most likely. And, and then so then people don't like, you know, the powers that be don't like that. They don't want you to break windows. They, they don't think that's good, but they don't really understand. They understand, but don't really want to say that people have like are over the top and they have decided that they're going to resist. And, you know, we have to deal with it. And so it is a crisis of confidence and trust in our system. So it's a real fundamental issue of our democracy to make sure that we we deal with um, how we want to be policed. So I think it's a, a long, a longer term process to solve this, and we'll have many components to it. 
Awesome. Um, and then for the final part of the question, um, uh, if you have any other uh, propositions you'd like to speak about um, in regards to um, police reform, uh, okay. you, you seem very knowledgeable on this issue, but um, if you'd like more, um, not be the time to do so. Um, I think one of the things I've learned through my years of service as an alder is that um, violence is a public health issue and we treat it as a criminal justice issue. And we need to have apply the, the public health lens to violence. And even there was a, a couple of years ago, um, uh, quite a few um, gunshots, um, incidents of gunshots, it's not police, but just young people or whoever shooting off guns and hurting each other. And it's, so um, we stepped up and created um, a, a peer support process and a, a process to, mm, to disturb the, the violence. It's seen as like a transmission, like a, like a virus, this um, violence, where you need to like disrupt it in order to take each side and go, okay, you know, you have issues, stop. You can't just shoot at each other. And so to make sure that we engage, you know, people who have lived that experience, not just like white people like me going and telling them, well, I know it's best for you. No, people who've lived through it and know, you know, the, the, the danger and damage that this, um, un, this, this spiral creates. So we, need to, uh, so we need to have the leadership from the most affected communities do a lot of this work. And we need to help pay them fairly to do the work so that they're not just volunteering and it's somewhat of a professional thing but it's also a community based issue and should be community led so we need to balance you know people who can show up because they have lived experience and also do effective disruption so we also need help with those kids who need you know maybe turn to to gangs and violence as economic solutions to their situation so we need to acknowledge if you don't see that your future looks very bright and cheerful, what it, how do we help you get the skills and education and job opportunities that you need to see a, a different way forward? And so, and especially, you know, starting with younger kids, but also older kids need help too. Um, and so we need to learn skills like anger management, conflict resolution, those kind of skills. And then we also need to divert some of those funds from the larger criminal justice system to more restorative methods. So, you know, right now we have some local programs at the county level that, you know, it's pretty much if you hardly did anything wrong, you can go do restorative justice. But if you have sort of more uh, problems, you won't be recommended for that program. But I think we really need to, rec to expand and broaden restorative justice so that, you know, you go and face the person that you've hurt and then work through through that with them and other community people who can help you. Um, and then the larger question is like, we need to, you know, take the guns out of people's easy access to guns. I mean, it's one thing if you just have fights, like when I was a kid, just fought at the schoolyard, right? But now it's like guns drive by shooting at each other. And so the access to guns needs to be really limited, but that's also a federal issue. Okay, um, I'll go on to the next one. Before I do that, I should say we, uh, at the time limit we set, uh, at the beginning, we ran 50 minutes total. We're about down to 12 minutes, and we got, I think, eight questions left. I okay. think they're shorter, so I can go. But yeah, just, I'll, be, I'll yeah. be quicker. Thank you for that. All right. Um, who did you support <laughs> in the Democratic Party? <laughs> Bernie. <What's that>? Bernie. <laughs> it's supported in the Democratic Party primary, and when did you support Bernie? Uh, when did you start publicly supporting Bernie? Um, at some point, the campaign reached out to me, and I, I agreed to support him, but then COVID and everything collapsed. So you probably never saw it, but I definitely have supported him as I did the last time around. And he's the reason I'm running for a partisan office. Because I really, I, uh, council is nonpartisan and I never really, really wanted, I don't, I mean, I'm a, I guess I'm a Democrat, but you know, I'm not like a, a Democrat, capital D, like let's go team. Like, no, the, the team Democrats kind of screwed up and it doesn't really represent most people the way it's configured. I think a lot of people want it to be better than it is. So anyway, yeah. Is that a quick myself? Um, yep. 
Uh, what is your uh, analysis analysis of the uh, the Evers administration's handling of uh, COVID nineteen uh, crisis in Wisconsin, uh, including uh, his handling of the uh, processes leading up to the uh, April seventh election? Um, I think I mean he has the authority to make those emergency orders, and that was quite welcome. I'm not sure they were strong enough, and but um, they are what they were. Um, and I think it really helped us for a while to shut down things. And, and that the, of course, the judiciary interfered and, 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 or the state legislature interfered and got the judiciary and state uh, Supreme Court involved. Um, and so that meant that the April election was not, it should have been postponed. It really should have. Um, there was no reason it had to happen and especially expose people. I mean, Madison was better prepared than say Milwaukee, but that was just, that was criminal what they did. Um, especially since all those Republicans went and voted absentee and or safely and, and, but they didn't let everybody else have the same opportunity. Um, the state legislators just, I mean, they did some early help for businesses, but it's mostly about businesses they help and not, and less about like, just reg, you know, working people like, so like as I work at the Department of Revenue, like you know, don't touch business, you know, help businesses, but you know, everyone else who's upside down, I mean, yeah, that will work with you, but it's not like you know they get anything delayed, um, and so, yeah, it, it's really been, I mean, I think Tony could have been stronger than he's been, and and just certainly now, you know, with the like, the Badger bounce back thing, it's just like and letting us get back um, reopening too soon. I mean, I know they want to like get us back to quote normal, but I, I've been saying lately there, there won't be, ever, we can't go back to the old normal. Everything's going to have to change about how we organize our economy and our healthcare and just all of that. But so I've been somewhat disappointed, but it, again, I'd rather have Evers in office than Walker. So I think it was better than it certainly could have been. Um, are you supportive of the BDS uh, movement, uh, boycott, uh, divestment, sanctions movement? Definitely, and if you're just not saying the word Israel, I would say it out loud that we certainly need to make sure that we don't support um, repressive regimes of any sort and anywhere in the country, including our own country. Um, so I don't know how we boycott, divest, and sanction our own government, but we're just as criminal as some of the other ones that this effort would be is involved in. It's been an many multi-year um, project, so I, I support it. Awesome. And then that sort of same sort of vein, um, I do believe that protesting is a uh, form of speech uh, and therefore the yeah, right to do so, including, uh, you know, uh, BDS and anti-pipeline movements um, uh, that those shouldn't be punished by the government. Oh, definitely. Um, you know, I guess that even includes the reactionary forces too. But um, yeah, I think the right to speech is a fundamental and whether that includes money as speech, I think certainly we can say that's not what we mean. But I think people who um, go and protest environmental and um, apartheid and all the other ways that the system hurts communities, I, I support that. Uh, can you list unions that have already endorsed you in this race, and which labor endorsements are you seeking? Uh, the only one that I've received so far is the Service Employees and International Union. I, I interviewed with Madison Teachers, Inc. I don't know yet anything about that, whether they'll endorse or not. I have not yet been invited to an AFSCME process or a, state, uh, or a, a South Central Federation of Labor, or they might I think I was informed by Scuffle they're not they're going to stay out of the 76. Um, and as again, as I said earlier, I am a union member and asked me. Um, and so I would seek uh, most union support. I, I kind of laughed though because I, I did meet with the building trades and historically they've never supported me because as an alder, I, I don't always just go build it, build it, build it. I'm like, hmm, is this the right scale? Is this the right density? Is this enough affordable housing? So I'm always questioning things. So they don't usually support me. So I don't expect that. I don't expect the police union to support me. They never have, except in 2011, they supported everybody who stood with, you know, um, the uprising. But that was an anomaly year. 
Yeah. Um, and next is sort of um, a little bit of a technical camp, uh, question about the campaign um, in regards to fundraising. Um, uh, well, a few here. Um, so how much have you raised uh, as of the state and race? No, I can't tell you exactly because I'm not the person that is in charge of that, but I'd say over $12,000. Um, um, the top three donors are, well, first of all, it would be SEIU, thank you, um, and um, a family members, you know, at a higher level, and um, and I don't know the percentage. I, I've, pr I've probably gotten over 130 donations that I'm aware of, and mostly they range anywhere from 20 to hundred dollars and there are a few that are more so of course I appreciate everyone's uh, support it's not my it's my first election for state assembly so I'm not sure that's what you mean but um, in my last election I ran unopposed so many times and I never really had to raise money so I hadn't raised money in a long time in the city elections I maybe spent five thousand dollars all told when I last had a really contested race so um, do you support the legalization of recreational cannabis, including the expungement of all previous cannabis related charges and the release of all those currently serving time on those charges? I definitely do. It seems like the drug war has created, it's been such a racist failure. Um, and it seems like marijuana is one of those, you know, maybe, you know, it's like, a, to me, it's equivalent to alcohol and you don't get put in prison for drinking too much alcohol. So I think it, um, I support the legalization and expungement of those charges. And I like, you know, we, we talk about like um, defunding the police. That would be one thing if we could reduce the capacity in our prison system based on like less people getting um, put in prison for, you know, so softer drug related charges. I mean, obviously there are some that are more deadly and dangerous, but it doesn't seem that marijuana really fits that. Oh, yeah. Um, and then for the final question, just another quick technical one. Um, do you have any... No, no nobody. It's all volunteer. 